Uh, my name is Joel. I'm one of the leaders in the church here. If you're new, if you have a Bible with you, perhaps you could turn with me to the, the Old Testament in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel. Uh, we are starting this series called Bless next week. So this is the last time we will be in Samuel for a long time. Uh, we've been going through Samuel for the last 150 years, and I'm, I'm uh, one of those preachers that likes doing long series. Is This is not the last we will see of Samuel. We will be back uh, as long as I'm the pastor here, we will be back in this book. But for a stretch, we're going to just uh, leave it here. At chapter 12, I'm going to read you verses 1 to 10, and then we'll pray and get into it. Give you a bit of background on this. This is the story of uh, one of the great heroes of the Bible, King David. He was the second king of Israel, chosen by God to be king, and, uh, and finally became the king after a long season of having to hide as a fugitive uh, from the existing king, who didn't want to be replaced, and then when he finally became king, uh, he, was, he was, it seems, uh, sitting on a pile of, of success and wealth and power. And then we, we read about last time we were in this story, a few weeks ago actually, uh, the, the terrible fall that came in his life. It's a tragic story that someone so pure-hearted, so apparently devoted to God, so, so good... Uh, made a terrible mistake and turned into uh, one of those corrupt rulers that you, you, uh, you feel sad about whenever you read in the papers about scandals and corruption in high places. David was one of the worst of them. Uh, he committed adultery. He had the husband of the woman he took uh, killed, and he, he tried to cover it all up. It was horrible. And by the end of chapter 11, our whole opinion of David may have changed. You know, we feel the, the sense of his uh, shocking fall, but we also feel the, the amazement that no one's called him on it. No one knows. He seems to have got away with the whole thing. And so we're going to come in at chapter 12 in the middle of that story. He's, he seems to have successfully covered his tracks, but of course, uh, you can't ultimately cover your tracks if there's a God, if God is real. If, if there's such a thing as right and wrong, uh, truth and falsehood, if, if these things matter, if there is a, a judgment at the end of our lives, then in the end, we can't really hide. However much we think we've hidden away, uh, these things will be found. And so the Bible goes on to tell the next part of the story, and it involves uh, one of God's servants, who was a prophet called Nathan. So let me read to you. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he'd bought. And he brought it up and it grew with him and with his children. He used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in him are all the 
riches of wisdom and knowledge. Every good thing we need. And we want to know him better. We want to feed on him today in the Bible. We pray that as we look at this story, you would show us more of yourself. Show us more of your son. Lead us by your spirit to show us also more about ourselves and our own hearts and our need for your grace and your willingness to give it to us. We pray, speak to us and change us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Nathan is God's spokesman in this story. He's uh, got the difficult job of confronting a king. That is always going to be hard in any era or culture in history to go and speak to the head guy about something he doesn't want to hear and about something he thought he'd covered up. But in this culture, this time in history, it's perhaps especially dangerous. David would have had uh, a lot of uh, ease comparatively in getting Nathan removed. If Nathan simply blustered into his court and said, I know all about you. Uh, You took someone else's wife and you killed him. I think David might have found it quite easy to just dispatch of the man or cover it up or this guy is obviously mad. or I don't know what he would have done, but, but uh, Nathan doesn't choose the, the uh, confrontational approach at first. It's, it's a little bit more like judo, what he does here. You know how judo works? You basically use the momentum of your opponent against them. You, you, you take their strength and turn it to your advantage. And you see what he does in telling this story. He gets David's passions flared. David cares about justice. <laughs> he cares about sheep. <laughs> He's a shepherd. You know, that's where he grew up. Uh, he, he really does care about the disadvantaged, the poor. When he hears about someone stealing someone else's lamb uh, for the sake of his own greedy gain, uh, that, that makes him uh, hot-tempered. And he starts to say, so this man should die. And he starts to lurch forward <laughs> like a bad wrestler. And Nathan, the expert judo champion, uh, just turns it into, uh, you're the man. And David's landed on the blade. Oh, oh, you're right. It's a masterful bit of storytelling. It's an ingenious way. And the Bible is, you need to know, the Bible has a lot of ingenious stories in it. Even if you don't believe you'll have to agree with me. The Bible is full of incredible wisdom and communication skill. Genius comes out of every page. It is, a, it is a powerful book of stories, and it gets under your skin. And it got under David's skin that, that this man knew, and he knew how to get to him. He knew that even the thing that David felt so righteous about was something that he'd fallen even worse in than this bad guy in the story. Because the man in the story is just like David. The man in the story should know better, but also has no reason to take the lamb of this poor individual. He's wealthy. It says early on in the, in the story, the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he'd bought. This guy is incredibly wealthy. He has plenty. So it's, it's, it's outrageous that he should turn on this other man. And and Nathan's making precisely that point. He's saying, why did you go after Bathsheba? (sighs) Look what you have. Look what I have given you. That's God's voice to David. You you read right there in the end of verse 7 to the beginning of verse 8. I anointed you. This is God speaking. This is how God speaks to people often in the Bible. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives. And that's a little strange, okay? (laughs) That's a strange gift of God to give. Uh, It doesn't mean that God approves of polygamy. You only have to read the first page of the Bible to see that. So let's just put that to rest. God definitely wasn't in favor of David having lots of wives. It seems as though God's kind of ironically saying, you know, if you're into that, don't forget, you had plenty of wives. That's one way to read it. But what we do know is God says one man, one woman. That's what marriage is from the very beginning of the Bible. And I gave you all these things, and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. 
all of these blessings. David was a, a remarkably favored man. By this stage of his life, he was the king. He was, he was set up as ruler. He was uh, hugely wealthy. He had so many extraordinary things going for him that it seems, if you stop and think about it, utterly irrational that he should turn aside and be distracted by a passing temptation that comes to him in the, in the form of this lady that he noticed when he was dawdling around on his palace roof one afternoon, one lazy afternoon. Why did you do that? Look at what I've given you. Look at all the many things that you all already possess. Now, I, I'm staying here for a moment because this is actually the way that God speaks to people repeatedly through the Bible. And it tells us something about the nature of our own greediness, our own failure. At the heart of all human failure and weakness, at the heart of all of our tendency to disobey God and to turn aside from God, is, is what we could call discontentment. It's a failure to be content in the many blessings that God has given us. It's a failure to rejoice it to feel deeply satisfied to to stay in that place of satisfaction like look at all that he has given me the bible tells that story from the beginning this is this is our story you and i as human beings the bible says we bear the image of god we were created uniquely we're not just animals we're not just parts of creation we're uniquely made for this relationship with him and given the, the opportunity to have uh, stewardship, responsibility for his creation, to enjoy it, to enjoy its blessings. The Bible talks about the first man and the first woman being put in this paradise place, the Garden of Eden, and being told excessively, you may enjoy the fruit of all of the trees of the garden. You can have everything you see. Everything you see, and this wasn't just, this isn't like someone's front garden in the suburbs. This wasn't even like, you know, I don't know, Sheffield Park Gardens. This was, this was a vast expanse. You can have all of this, but just do not have the fruit of this tree. The day you eat the fruit of this tree, you'll surely die. Now, here's the thing about our nature, our, our, our heart. What, what happened from the beginning, we're told, is, is the man and the woman start to be more interested in the one thing that they've been deprived of. They start listening to the lie and feeding the lie that this, this law, this rule, this restriction, this limitation is proof that God is against them. God is, God is trying to hold out against them, prevent them from enjoying his creation, prevent them from enjoying full stop. They, they believe this in that, they, they receive that into their soul, oh, God doesn't really want me to be happy. And because they're convinced about that, it, it actually costs them everything. They yield to that lie, they yield to this sense that God is against me, he's not favoring me. And the Bible tells us this story because it, it's, it's, it's right at the very heart, as the Bible describes us, of, of, of human nature, a tendency to, to simply not be satisfied and contented with all that he gives. This is precisely what's happened to David. You'd think, God, oh, the wealth he has. And Nathan tells the story. You see, this, you see this man in the story. He's got cattle. He's got sheep. He's got flocks. But he takes, why? Why would you do this? Why would you take this one lamb from this poor man? What, what kind of cruelty would, would motivate you? To do something so despicable. And you know, it's, it's not necessarily cruelty in its heart. It's discontentment. It's failure to see all that God has given and to rejoice in all God's provision to me. To know he has favored me. He has done me good. Later on in the Bible, in, in the, the book of Jeremiah, one of the prophets of the Old Testament, God speaks again in this kind of way to his people. Just a couple of verses from it. It says, what wrong, verse 5, did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? What wrong have you found in me? Do you see the heart of God there? Maybe you've sometimes been in situations like that where you 
you've been betrayed by someone or abandoned by someone or let down by someone or had someone just leave you feeling a sense of, what, what, what's wrong with me? Why would you turn from me? This is a huge thing for us to work through. It's, it's, in, it's, it's in God's heart. God deals with us this way. If it says in verse 31, You, O generation, behold the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why then do my people say, We are free. We will come no more to you. God's like, Have I been a wilderness to you? Is that what I am? Is that what I'm like? Is, am I just a desert? Do I give nothing good? And David got to that point, we can only understand it that way. He got to this point where he began to think, there's nothing more good to come from God. I'm I'm bored by him. I'm not in awe of him anymore. I'm not lost in wonder. I'm not taken aback by his goodness. It doesn't surprise me anymore. It doesn't excite me. It doesn't thrill me. It doesn't stir emotion within me. The Bible tells us this story to help us to see that that's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be, friends, to be no longer caught up with a sense of wonder at all that God has done for us. Truly, it isn't like David to be like this. If we know David's story at all, we'll know that's not David. This guy guy was constantly grateful. Generally, that was his style. You, You get to a few pages earlier in 2 Samuel Uh, 7, where he's praying to God uh, after being given a huge amount by God. He says in verse 18, he says in verse 18, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you've brought me thus far? He's just a shepherd boy. He's just Jesse's son. And yet, this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You've spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. This guy, David, he's been promised so much. He's been promised, your sons will be kings. One of your offspring, one of your great, 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 great grandson will be king forever, speaking about Jesus. David had been promised the greatest things ever. And at the stage where this happened, he's overwhelmed. His words are, who am I? It could be written on David's gravestone. Who am I? Who am I? In fact, later on in that same passage, he he says, Lord, you know me. As if to say, you you know how undeserving I am. If you've ever got into a relationship with the the amazing, merciful God that the Bible teaches us about, you'll understand how David feels, right? When when you get forgiven by God, when you get loved by God, when when you receive gifts from God, the instinct of the heart immediately will be, why would he do this for me? Because you're aware of how good he's been. You're also aware of how undeserving you are. You're aware of really, I don't, I don't des- I'm not worth this. No matter what the L'Oreal adverts tell me, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm being favored by sheer grace. This is a gift, an undeserved gift. And it will overwhelm you when you stay there and consider. Problem is, friends, listen. We don't tend to stay there. We tend to move away from that place of wonder. We tend to get calloused to it. We drift from it. Remember what I said, the man, the woman in the garden. All of this I give to you. Hang on, what about this tree? Why are we not allowed this tree? There's forests. But this tree I'm not allowed. We're obsessive. We get OCD about the one thing. The one thing that God said, no, no, this won't be good for you. I don't want you. This, th- trust me, you do not want that. It's not good. It won't bless you. It won't do you good. Oh, you're holding out against me. There's something there. That it, you, I can't trust you. You're against me. Why, what happens? We drift into this. We get, we get calloused because we're not living in the awe and the wonder of all of God's favor towards us. And, and Nathan's trying to help him to see, listen, David, David, look how much he gave you. Jesus spoke about this in all kinds of ways. One of them is in Matthew 18 where he's, he spoke to his disciples. He gathers them around. He, he puts a child in front of them. He says, look, look at this child. Look, look, this is what you have to be like to have a relationship with God. He says in Matthew 18 verse 3, uh, unless you become like a little child, unless you, 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 in some of the translations, unless you are converted 
and become like little children. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's an interesting phrase, unless you are converted. He's talking to converts. <laughs> he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to strangers. He's talking to his disciples. They've been with him for years, these guys. They've been following him around. You'd think that he would say to them, it's a good thing that you're converted, because that means you can be, you're, you're like little children. No, no, he's, he's saying, listen, guys, get converted. It's like he's saying, watch this. Do it every day. Become like a little child today and tomorrow. Not just because you have been a Christian for a few years. He said, there's a danger. You can be a Christian for years, but gradually lose this childlikeness. The sense of wonder can leave you. It's fascinating watching kids. I, I had a, a family day yesterday. It was a bit of a gathering. I have lots of brothers and sisters, and we all have thousands of kids. So when we gather together, there's always like this huge kind of frenzy going on, kids running around. And I'm watching some of my kids. My youngest son, who's only just turning two soon, and... Uh, just watching the way he, he moves around a garden or a, a house, everything he sees grips him with fascination. <laughs> Within every square yard, there's something to catch his attention. With every, every move, every step he takes, oh, this is this, 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 this. And, and I'm watching, thinking, this, this is perhaps a clue here as to what Jesus was meaning. Because unless you are converted and become like little children. You know, G.K. Chesterton used to say, maybe the fact that the sun rises every day is not monotony. It's because God is like a little child. And every time it happens, he says, do it again. <laughs> you ever had that relationship with, with a, you ever had a conversation with a kid, or it's not really a conversation. You do, you know, I, I tickle him under his neck, or in his neck. If I can find under his neck, it's kind of <laughs> flabby. But I, I kind of stay, and he's kind of, you can tell he wants to do it again. He wants to do it again, do it again, do it again. And kids can be like that. Do it again, do it again, do it again. And we as adults, we, we feel we're more sophisticated than them. Well, when your sense of humor is a little bit more sophisticated, you'll understand that this is actually rather tedious. <laughs> uh, you need to have more nuance and subtlety in your sense of humor. When you're old and boring like me, you'll realize this isn't so funny. But they, they, no, no, this, is, this, is, this could keep me entertained for a month, what you're doing right now. And, and Jesus is saying, you have to become like little children. Maybe the kids have got something on us here. Maybe we're the ones who've got it wrong. Chesterton says, maybe God is younger than we are. Because every morning, he says, do it again. Re repetition in nature is maybe God saying, encore, encore. He's, he's constantly lost in wonder. And we adults, we've lost something. Don't move away from the wonder that you may have had when you first found grace, found sufficiency in Christ, found God to be everything that you needed. Nathan tells a story of this lamb. I find it fascinating. He uses a lamb story. That lamb motif comes up in the Bible quite a few times, you may have noticed. If you've read the Bible, you'll know that, that, that there's a few stories about lambs. And I, I can't help thinking of uh, when I see this story of this poor man who had a lamb who he dearly loved that was like a daughter to him. I'm thinking about the one who had a son who became the lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That when, when Jesus was, was baptized, it says that there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the one I love. God's tremendous passion for his dear son is overwhelming. And when, when you read a story about a guy who's so wealthy, but when a, a friend knocks on his door, for fellowship, he goes to find the lamb from someone else. You're reading about a heart that is precisely the opposite of the heart of God. See, you've got to understand it's, it's a cultural thing that, that we, we wouldn't necessarily realize. When a friend comes in to your house, in, in some of the Middle Eastern cultures, especially at this time, somebody coming through your door, a friend coming, or anyone, any, even a stranger, paying you the honor of coming into your house, that is a moment, well, frankly, it's a moment when all the animals in the household get nervous. 
because guests mean death for animals. Guests, guests mean food. You've come to my house, we must, we'll have to kill something. We're going to feast together. We're going to have friendship. We're going to sit down. We're going to do relationship. We're going to reconcile. We're going we're gonna to be one together over the table. The, the Bible tells a story of a God who wants to do that with you. He wants to sit down with you, eat with you, drink with you. He wants to take you into his confidence. He wants to have fellowship with you. Jesus, the Bible says, came eating and drinking. He got into trouble because he, he made friends and ate at table with tax collectors and sinners. He, he made friends with people all over the place by stopping and eating with them. The Bible has a, a, a story. The story at the end of the Bible is, is a, a wedding feast, a supper. We come, the nations will come. All those who God has chosen, all those who have a relationship with God, sit down to feast with him. Even the fact that at the very beginning, God offers to the man and the woman food, fruit from trees. Do you get the point? All through Scripture, there's this emphasis. Come and sit with me. Eat with me. Let's, let's, let's do lunch. Let's, let's feast together. Let's eat together. It's in the very kind of DNA of our relationship with God. And so Nathan's saying, there's this, this, this rich man, and a stranger knocks on his door. And so they feast together. And so, right, who's, who's going to die? What animal is going to get taken out? But instead of finding his own, he finds someone else's. This is the opposite of God's heart. What did God do to, to make it possible for us to feast with him? What is the thing he did? So he, he takes his best, his beloved son, in whom he's well pleased. Jesus is slain. Jesus is killed. Jesus is taken. And Jesus' blood is shed, and it gives us the opportunity for friendship, fellowship. It gives us the chance to have a relationship with this God. All of this grace that gets given to us, and yet we're not caught in wonder. We're not lost in praise as, as we could be. And this is David's failure. I anointed you, he says. I gave you identity. I rescued you. Do you realize how bad it could have been if I hadn't rescued you from Saul? Let me ask you, friends, if, you, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, or even if you're not yet a Christian, you're here today and you're thinking, what's God ever done for me? I, I would suggest you think of it the other way around. How bad could it be if God hasn't protected? God, how much worse could things be? What has God rescued you from? How has he, how has he stepped in? Maybe some people in marriage situations will be thinking, oh, my marriage is in such bad shape. Maybe financially. My finances are absolutely just, they. How, how am I going to get out of this mess? What, what's going to, or maybe your, your work situation. I don't know what it is. Unemployment. There could be a variety of ways in which you're, you're questioning the goodness of God. Just for a moment, consider what has God delivered you from? How much worse could it have been? There's health in taking that perspective. David hasn't been considering how much God has delivered him from. David hasn't been considering how God has given him new identity. I anointed you. I set you up. David hasn't been enjoying the gifts. I gave you, he says. Again, that, that verse, verse 8. I gave you all these things to enjoy God's gifts, to enjoy God in the gifts which is really important because what you can hear me saying today, if you're not careful, we get into a slightly religious, super spiritual perspective on what I'm saying. Yeah, I think the preacher is saying that we've got to be content in God um, and then we won't fall into sin. So presumably that means you're coming to lots of meetings and, and having prayer times. And then if, as, long as, I'm, as long as I'm having spiritual experiences, I won't be kept away from, I'll be kept away from sin. I'll be kept away from mistakes and failure and wrongdoing by, by having a, certain kinds of experiences in meetings or wherever it is. Listen, friends, those things are all good and important, but please don't forget to see the goodness of God given you in all kinds of ways, the range of ways in which he has blessed you. And to just sit and enjoy the goodness of God, to enjoy his favor, his blessing, to enjoy his, his gifts to you in all kinds of practical ways. 
the gifts of, of things that you think, well, this isn't spirit, this is just, just a favorite TV program. This is just a, you know, this is just a sport, this is just a game, this is just hanging out with my family, this is just food and drink. Is, no, 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 friends, these are all gifts. These are all contexts, opportunities to give thanks to God. Opportunities to be grateful, to rejoice in his goodness towards you. Enjoy his favor, enjoy his lavishness in the gifts of creation that you receive through Christ. They're just as much opportunities. to You can turn them back to praise as we sing in one of our songs. Every blessing you pour out. Turn it back to praise. Enjoy him in every way, in every conceivable way that he's prepared to give to you. Take time to do it. Take time to set it into your diary. Set it into every week. Sabbath. Get a rhythm in your life. The things that you know that you're able to enjoy, as well as coming to be with God's people, as well as singing worship, as well as spending time every day before him, settling your soul, enjoying his grace, reminding yourself of his mercy, as well as all of that, Take time every week to feed your soul with those things that God has used to bring refreshment to you. I don't know what your thing is. It could be anything. It it, it could be as simple as watching Match of the Day. It could be. But to sit and turn it back to praise, God, thank you for your gifts to me. Thank you for these ways I'm able to unwind. I receive it as grace from you. Don't cut your life in half too much, friends. Enjoy his blessings in all these ways. And then I want to say, finally, before I close, I want to say that we can still miss a major part of David's words to Nathan's words to David. Because I've talked about contentment in the things, the gifts that God has given. But it's striking if you read the whole of verse 8, you get to the second half. I gave you all these things, I gave you this, I gave you that, I gave you the other. And he says in, in verse 8, if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. If this were too little. What, what, what I find striking there is that God has already given David, if you consider what he's been given, basically David's been told, yeah, through you, basically David, you are now king of the world and your grandchildren will be king of the universe. You, know, it's, you are the most favored man in history. But if that's not enough for you, I'm happy to give you just as much over. I'll give you another universe. If you, I'll give you another world. I'm that happy. I'm that keen to do you good. See, friends, when we get discontented with God, it's not just that we're getting discontented with the things he has given us. We're getting discontented with the things he is still prepared to give and wants to give. We're forgetting his willingness to go on blessing. See, I I want to make this point because I want you to see the huge difference between contentment and conservatism. Contentment and, and really dull religion. Where effectively, what we're saying is, well, I think I, I'd like these many things, but I've, I've been told I'm supposed to be content. So presumably, that's, that's fine. I'll carry on being content. Nothing will change in life, but I'm content. You have to be careful here because what I'm saying is be content in God. And being content in God is a big deal. Because who he is and what he can do is limitless. What he's willing to do, the prayers he's willing to answer, you have no idea the adventure he might want to take you on. And when we turn away from sin and say, no, I won't have that because I've got God. No, I won't go that way. I won't stay out that way. I won't, I won't return that text. I won't return. I won't flirt with that person. I won't, I won't because, no, no, because I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content with, with, with all the things I have. You could fall into such a religious trap here. You know, because what you hear me saying when I say, be content in God, you could hear me saying, be satisfied with your boring life and stop asking questions. That's not what the Bible teaches. When you read, when you read the way that the scriptures invite us to ask and ask again, you are invited into a relationship with a God who's willing to answer and willing to give 
like a father, a good father. And if it's the wrong prayer, you'll find out. You'll find out by asking. Sometimes people come up to me and say, am I allowed to pray for this? I like this. Am I allowed to pray for that? And I've, got, I've started saying, there's only really one way to find out. I know there is some, you know, sometimes advice is, you know, I've read a few books on prayer, and some people say, well, you should learn to just pray according to God's will. You know what? I think you probably learn God's will by getting it wrong a lot. Be a child again. Go back and say, Father, what about this? What about that? What about that? To keep asking, to keep remaining ambitious is a vital key in this whole piece called contentment. David has stopped doing that. He's got to the place perhaps where he stopped being ambitious. He stopped being hungry. He stopped longing. What are you longing for from God? What are you hungry for from him? What could you be hungry for? We, we talked at the start of last year, quite spontaneously, Simon Brading brought it in one of our meetings, a, a prayer gathering we had. He just said, let's all make impossible lists this year. Let's all make an impossible list. And it's kind of got into our language. We talk about it as staff quite a lot. We talk about it as leaders. What's on your impossible list this year? I want to encourage you guys, don't yield that. Hold on to those things. Keep impossible lists. Keep them close to you. Keep them in your wallet. Keep them in your diary. Keep them on your phone. Keep coming back to them. Stay in that place because God's attitude to you is, I'll give you more. I would have given you more. My favor is on you. think, well, that's David. It's, he's different. He's King David. He's special. Listen, David is special. Why? Because David is linked with Christ. You are just as linked with Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus, the Bible says you're in Christ. All the favor that God has for his beloved son, Jesus, is upon you. It's on you. That in itself should be enough to blow our minds. But to receive it ought to also turn us into prayers, askers. If I have found favor in your eyes, now show me your glory. Give me more. Let me ask you, can I, know, can I have this? Can I experience this? It just, that sounds a bit selfish. Sounds a bit greedy. Sounds a bit ambitious. Well, you know what? God says, come to me with your ambitions. Come to me with your longings. And if you find in that place of prayer, think this is, this is pointless. God doesn't seem to be answering my prayers. He's been a wilderness to me. Do you remember like in Jeremiah? He's been like a desert to me. Friends, bring those prayers to him. Bring those longings. Bring those yearnings. Even bring the pain of it. Sometimes our praying should take on that dimension. There are plenty of prayers in this book that sound almost whingy. You read the Psalms, you'll notice it quite a lot. Even David himself, often praying in that kind of, God, where are you? Why have you not shown up? What have you done? Where, why are you leaving me in this place? Are you feeling that sometimes? Are you feeling that God has abandoned you when you've tried to pray for things? Are you feeling that God has ignored you and left you to one side? you feel you've been praying for something for months, maybe even years, and it hasn't come good? What do you do with that? Well, you've got two choices. You could just bottle it up in anger and just be silent before God and treat him like he's a wilderness. Or you can turn that grief into prayer. Come back to him with it. Say, God, where? Please prevail. Press through those seasons. Keep pleading with him. Do not doubt his goodness. Do not yield to discontentment. Don't fall into it. Stay contented in him. This is David's mistake. It was his biggest mistake. It was his huge error, and it led to terrible destruction to him, to his family, to his nation. Every one of us stands in a place of decision today. Every single one of you. Will you trust in God's goodness? And if you doubt whether he is good, remember what he did with his lamb. Remember how he has prepared a way for you to sit at his table. 